Hey everyone, welcome to chapter three. This chapter is going to focus on listening, attending, and empathy, which is the essential for relationship building. This is probably one of the most important chapters to really grasp because this is going to show how you are in the counseling room and your ability to be able to hear someone when they are talking about their issues and actively listening and being able to attend and respond back to them. All right, so moving towards the chapter goals and the competency objectives for your awareness and knowledge, you wanna develop a solid understanding of how attending behavior, attention, and selective attention form the basis for all theories of counseling and therapy, understand how the basics of neuroscience explain and expand the importance of attention and empathy, Learn how teaching micro skills of listening is a useful therapeutic strategy with both children and adults, and discover micro counseling's use in medical, law, business training, and other professions, both nationally and internationally. Sounds like a lot, I know, but as you get deeper into your counseling field, you're going to see that sometimes you need to understand medical issues. You need to understand the law. You need to understand Bit different business trainings because you're going to be getting people from all different places going through all different things and you may have to tap into some of these other professions. For your skills in action, ability to listen, provide empathy, and communicate more effectively with your clients whose backgrounds may dip may be different from your own, which goes into that cultural background that I talked about before. Ability to adapt your attending patterns and style to the needs of clients with different cultural and individual styles, including those whose backgrounds and beliefs may be different from yours. So again, you don't have to come from the same cultural background. You just have to have an understanding that everybody has differences and to be able to have that empathy and be able to listen and reflectively you know, communicate back with them. And then the ability to use recovery skills when you are lost or confused in the session and when it is clear that your last counseling comments were not fully helpful. Even the most advanced professionals, professional doesn't always know what is happening. When you don't know what to do, attend. And we'll talk about that even more, but I've even been in situations where I was lost or confused and sometimes when I am with a client, I will ask for clarification. I will ask them to explain what they mean by that. And sometimes, you know, your comments, you have to be very clear because someone else's perception of what you're saying, they may take differently. So I text with a lot of clients too. So make sure that all of your text language is very I don't want to say basic, but it's very neutral. And anytime you feel that there might be some miscommunication, say in your text, what I want to, what I want to do is clarify what I mean. All right. Ability to use listening skills in the context of telemental health or telepsychology. Ability to use training in, in listening skills as treatment and teach listening skill workshops for a variety of groups, including businesses, churches, peer counseling, and many others. Now, you want to try in your school career to take different workshops and classes, not to become an expert in that, but just to become knowledgeable. And many times when you start doing these different trainings, you find that, wow, I really like this workshop. I might wanna do this as part of my practice. So it's really good to have a super, good holistic approach so that you can hone in on your skills and what your skill set is. And ability to promote practice, 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 practice is the way to become an intentional leader. And just remember, practice doesn't make perfect, it makes permanent. So you want to make sure that what you're practicing is the correct thing. All right, so let's go into now the terminology of what I was talking about. So attending behavior. And, you know, you can maybe start your own journal of, you know, definitions 
Not that you will ever live by a definition when you're doing counseling, but if you're stuck on certain things and you don't know what they mean, make your own little journal, make your own little dictionary and put little notes in there. How am I going to best remember this? <clears throat> Just something, a little tip for you. All right, so attending behavior is supporting your client with individually and culturally appropriate verbal, verbal following, visuals, vocal quality and body language slash facial expression. So you don't want to be in a session and if you're bored or whatever, because it happens, you just want to make sure you're attending. So you're present, you are there and you're not just like uh, staring in space or you're not looking down or looking around, but you're looking at them. You can look around, but constantly stay focused <clears throat> and keep your, you know, your vocal quality, you know, where it needs to be. If you're excited, be excited. If you're, you know, if you feel that kind of somberness with them, then lower the tone, but just try to be as active and as attending as possible. All right. So attending behavior is essential to building an empathetic and therapeutic relationship. To me, attending is just being real. It's being authentic. It's actually being present and being there. Listening is the core skill of attending behavior and is central to developing relationships and making real contact with client. Listening is more than hearing. That is super important. <clears throat> and I remember one time, and it was actually one time, that I was not listening. And this was years ago, but it was more of like, I was hearing the words, keyword hearing, but not listening, not reflecting, not doing any of that. So I remember a client asking me a question and I just couldn't even, I was like, uh, and I said, you know what? Because I'm honest. I said in that moment, I was hearing you, but I wasn't listening. And I didn't get that from a textbook. I knew the difference between listening and hearing. So it's really essential if that's one thing you can take away from me is make sure you're actually listening. And if there are things in your life you went through a really rough day, or you're really tired, it is better to reschedule your appointment than just go and not listen. Because guess what? They will notice. Maybe one client won't notice, but eventually they will notice. All right, so attending and listening light up the brain. Many areas of the brains of both counselor and client become involved. Because when you're, just think about having like a good conversation with your friend or somebody that you know very well. When you're both attending and listening, it's that flow back and you can repeat, oh yeah, like you said this. It's, you're, you're making that connection. And when you can do that with a client, you're going to keep that client happy as far as they're gonna to wanna to come back to you and they're going to tell others about you. All right, one way to understand good quality listening is to experience the opposite, poor listening. Anytime you think about you know the good stuff, think about the opposite, like what is terrible listening look like? What is like, think about a situation in maybe your own life when you were talking to somebody and they were like, did you even hear what I said? And you're just like, yeah. And then they ask you to repeat it back. And then you're like, uh, I don't know what you said. I do that at home sometimes with my kids. I shouldn't, but I'm honest um, because at some point your brain gets tired. And if you've been doing this all day and talking and listening, you kind of shut off. So in the whole grand scheme of everything, you have to make sure that you balance out your work life with your personal life. All right, so find a partner to role play a session. This would be a really good idea. Find someone at home, a friend, whatever. Spend three minutes role playing a poor and ineffective listener. So this is something that I think you should do. And if you do this, tell me about it and you just might get some extra credit. So spend three minutes role playing a poor and ineffective listener. After the role play, play session, Ask the client how they felt inside or emotionally when the counselor did not listen. It's not one of these, tell me how you feel. Tell me, how does that make you feel? I mean, if that's how you approach it, okay, just be real. So did it feel like 
you were being listened to, however your style is or what you want to say. If no partner is available, think of a specific time when you felt that you were not heard, like I said before. So if you desire some extra credit and you want to do this, then either role play with somebody or think of a time where you felt like you were not being heard. You were not being listened to, or maybe yourself. Was there a time that you can think of that stands out in your memory where you did that to someone else? All right, when you use the micro skills, you can anticipate how a client is likely to respond. Now, I've had a couple people say to me, you know, I don't know what micro skills are yet. I'm not that good at it. You, it's a word. It's a word. And as you start to develop your micro skills, you'll realize you're doing it. So it becomes much more attainable and easy. All right. Attending behavior has predictable results in conversations with clients. These predictions are never perfect, but research has shown we can generally expect specific results from various types of helping interventions. And if your first attempt at listening is not received well, you can intentionally flex and use a different skill. You're going to have different skill sets. You're going to have different listening skills. You are going to find that certain things work for you, certain things work for others. And it's kind of finding that happy medium because there are times when I have to adjust kind of my pattern for someone else. But as you do this more, it becomes second nature and you don't even realize you're doing it. All right. So attending behavior, support your client with individually and culturally appropriate visuals, vocal quality, verbal tracking, and body language, including facial expression. Even if you do telehealth, which I do, I have a lot of clients online and I either see them face-to-face -face virtually, I see them in person, virtually face-to-face, -face, on the phone, and in a chat. And believe it or not, you can do equal therapy in all modalities. But when it comes to the body language, you can see when the person is right in front of you. You could see from head to toe. But as you become more experienced and you do telehealth, let's just say, you understand the tone. You understand how they're looking at you. And you automatically will get probably what their body is doing. So again, as long as you're attending to their behavior and your behavior, things start flowing very easily. Your anticipated result, clients will talk more freely and respond openly, particularly about topics to which attention is given. Depending on the individual client and culture, eye contact, vo vocal tone, completeness of story, and body language will vary. All right, so attention is the connective force of conversations and empathetic understanding. So again, this chapter is all about attending and listening and having empathy. So you want to practice your skills. And if you are really good at this already, if you have that nature of listening, that nature of hearing, because hearing anyone can do, but the two work together. So if you can hear what they're saying and really listen to it and it go in, that comes through you, your vocals because you're processing and you're reflecting. And you know, you hear people say, you know, when you're doing counseling. So what I'm hearing you say is, you don't have to say that, you or you can. So when you said, you know, that your husband uh, doesn't listen to you, and that was like, 10 sentences ago, when you're actively engaging with a client, you wanna take a little nuggets of information, just kind of put it in the, in the top. And then this way you can go back and then they feel heard because they said that a couple minutes ago. So once you start practicing those skills, they become much easier. And if you already have that innate empathetic skill and listening skill, it's going to be even much easier for you. All right. We are touched when it is present, so we feel. We know when someone is not attending to us. Think about yourself. Anytime you're hearing this and you're the counselor, you think about any time you've been on the other end where you're talking and you don't feel heard, you don't feel listened to, or you don't feel that they actually care. 
So attending behavior is the first and most critical skill of listening. Remember that. So just remember, I need to be attentive. I need to attend. I need to be present. It is, it is a necessary part of all interviewing, counseling, and psychotherapy. Again, when it comes to the interviewing, you're asking questions. This, this is going to be like in the beginning when you get to know somebody, the psychosocial, when you talk about family history, when you talk about what brought you to counseling, when you talk about your social environment, you're interviewing them. That's what you're doing. And you need to write down little notes. You can jot notes down in front of them. You don't have to wait until they leave because sometimes you forget. So you can have a pad or not. It all depends on your style. But if you're the type that kind of forgets, just jot down notes and let them know. You, you make eye contact, but you have a pad, pen, and just write, I'm going to write that down. I want, I want to keep that for my notes, blah, blah, whatever you want to say. Um, because it, it is important. You have to be present. And to me, attending, I'll say it over and over again, attending to me means presence. All right. Sometimes listening carefully is enough to produce change. There are some times when all I do is listen. Now I'm an extrovert, so I like to talk. And someone like me, I used to, I had to train myself to zip it because I want to talk. I want to talk. So I had to really hone in on my listening skills to be able to not interrupt, not jump in or do any of that. So I did a lot of role playing. I did a lot of role playing by myself and I did role playing with other people in the field just to be aware and stop myself. So sometimes I'll have clients that they do most of the talking during the session and all they needed to do was just get it out and they just needed some feedback from me. So there are times when I talk more and there are times when I talk a lot less. All right, so to communicate that you are listening or attending to the client, you need the following. Now, you can write this down. I never wrote this down, but, you know, if you're the type that it's like, you know, some people are visual, auditory, kinesthetic, it doesn't make anyone right or wrong. It just do what's best for you. But the three Vs, visual eye contact, keep eye contact, vocal qualities, you know, just kind of up and down, go with the flow. Verbal tracking, you know, track what you're saying, be very aware and mindful. And then plus the B, body language. You want to look at their body language and you want to kind of mimic it. So if I have a client that is kind of all over the place and they come in all excited, I'm going to start off a little excited with them, right? Because you want to match the energy. And then after like a minute or so when they're, you know, I'm going to lean in a little bit and I'm going to be more calm. I'm going to have a calmer presence and then that's going to transfer on them and then they start calming. And you'll notice as you do this, they start matching your energy. But the, the whole thing you want to do, match theirs in the beginning and then have them match yours in the end. This way you, you lead to a very calming, solution-focused therapy session. So I hope that kind of helps you in that regard. All right, so a description of the three Vs plus the B. All right, so visual eye contact. Look at people when you speak to them. Now, you might be saying, well, there are cultures where looking at someone in the eye is actually disrespectful. And yes, in some Asian countries, looking at someone in the eye is disrespectful. You don't do that. That is you know, that is someone that is higher than you. You don't do that. You look down. So for people of different cultural backgrounds, it's not that they're being rude. It's that to look at you is disrespectful, but it's not disrespectful for you to do it. You're the one in the practice. You give the contact. If they don't give it to you, you don't want to say, why aren't you looking at me? I mean, that's, don't do that. Just Understand culture. This is why you need to take a multiculturalism class so that you understand different people and they're not being rude. All right, vocal tone and qualities. Communicate warmth and interest with your voice. Think of how many ways you can say, I'm really interested in what you have to say. You don't have to say that, but you can think of ways 
that you can say that. If someone says something to me, I might say, that is so cool, tell me more. That might be one case. Or I might say, that's really interesting. I have never thought about that. What, like, tell me more about that. It just depends on the situation and what's going on in the room. All right, so just by altering your vocal tone and speech rate, try that now, recording your voice if that is possible. Experiment with vocal tone and speech rate. Note the importance of vocal tone and emotion, even with the same exact words. A lot of times it isn't what you say, it is how you say it, it is how it comes across. All right, verbal tracking. Stay with the client's topic, track their story, and avoid topic jumps. Don't change the subject. The client is here to talk, not to listen to you. Remember that the session is for the client. So if they're telling you something, do not say, oh yeah, I went through that. Oh yeah, I remember that. Like, it's about them. Don't make it about you. That is a big mistake. Only use something that's relatable to you or that's relatable like your story only if it's going to benefit them. So for example, I had breast cancer. This is a true story. I had breast cancer and I have had quite a few breast cancer patients. Some of them I didn't say anything to, but some of my breast cancer patients that were very scared and thought it was the end of the world, I shared a little bit of my story so that they could see what's on the other side of it. And when they could see how far I was out from my journey, it made them calmer. So it isn't about you, but do whatever you can to make them feel comfortable. So again, don't change the subject, make it about them, not you. All right, body language and facial expression, be yourself. Authenticity is essential to building trust. To show interest, face clients squarely, Lean slightly forward, an expressive face, and use encouraging gestures, especially critical smile to show warmth and interest you know, in the client. One big thing that I learned, and this was something the very beginning of my schooling, and it, it made sense, was if, you're, if you have your own office or you work in an office, don't have a desk. Try to not have a desk separate you between the client. So when I have my desk, it's in the corner. And when I have, you know, my clients, I have a nice cool chair and then I have a very comfortable couch and I sit across from them. And again, I lean in when I need to lean in and I back up when I need to back up. I don't get close up in their face or anything, but it shows that we're equal. Now I'm the professional, you know, they're coming into me for help, but they see there's no barrier. There's no desk that shows, look at me, I'm the professional and you're going to listen. They feel a sense of warmth and genuineness. So try to have that kind of, you know, inviting atmosphere. Obviously, if you're working in maybe an agency where a desk is a thing, okay, fine, do that. But if you feel like it, get from behind your desk move your chair over and sit across from them. It just gives them more trust and value in you as a person and as a professional. All right, the three V's plus the B, reduce counselor talk time and provide clients with an opportunity to tell detailed stories. Increase awareness of clients attending patterns. Note clients' patterns of eye contact, changing vocal tone, body language and topics to which your clients attend and those they avoid. When you take little notes like that and you get to know them, you start understanding their story and maybe give you the reason why they avoid eye contact or why their, their, their tones do change. You start developing your own pattern and understanding theirs. All right, note it, note individual and cultural differences in attending. So know what attending is in your culture versus someone else's. Attending behavior and listening are essential for human communication, but we need to be prepared for and expect individual and cultural differences because there's gonna be a time when you're faced with someone and you have no clue. And best thing you can do, ask. Ask questions yourself. All right, so listen before you leap. Listen to what they're saying, don't just offer advice, my best, best, best thing I can tell you, 
drop advice. Don't give advice. That is not your job to give advice. Advice doesn't work. Think about how many times someone gave you advice and it didn't work. You didn't want advice. You wanted to be heard. So your job as a counselor, therapist, practitioner, whatever you want to call it, your job is to listen, then speak on what you heard and just try not to just jump in. Avoid trying to solve clients' difficulties too soon. They need to process. I tell my clients all of the time, the therapy does not happen during the session. What we talk about, that's not therapy. The therapy truly is therapy when you leave my office and you start processing and you start thinking about the things that you said, the things that I said, and that little light bulb aha moment. That is true therapy. Clients develop their concerns over time. It's critical that you slow down, relax, and attend to their stories. Use the three V's plus the B to understand clients' concerns and build rapport. It's the biggest thing. You want to build a relationship with them. You want to build a sense where, not that they look forward to coming to see you, but wouldn't you rather have them look forward to coming to see you than be like, oh, I got to go do my counseling session. Because there are a lot of people that are forced into counseling because they have problems with their spouse. If you don't change, you better go to counseling. Or if you don't do this, blah, blah, blah. Or some people are forced because of arrest, court mandated stuff. So at the end of the day, you want to make sure that, hey, while we're here, let's make good value out of that time. The visual eye contact, observe cultural differences in appropriate amounts of eye contact, maintain and break eye contact as needed for specific results. So if you, if you have to think of something, you don't want to stare at them and think. You want to, you want to just be like, wow, hmm, like I didn't think of that. Look, look away. Do what feels natural to you. Observe client's pupils for dilation and use specific body language to achieve desired results. Whatever that body language is to get the result and it feels natural, do that. All right, changes in pitch and volume, speech breaks and hesitations, and speech rate can convey your emotional reactions to the client. So when they tell you something, you don't want to be like, whoa, you know, you need to have a sense of stability in your voice because you're going to hear some things that are produce shock and awe. You know, I've heard things that produced shock and awe in my brain. And then there's a point, you know, I've got my career that I've said to clients, like, you can tell me anything. I don't think there's really much of anything I haven't heard. And even if they do, and I'm like inside going, whoa, I, that they don't even know. I'm just like, okay, tell me more. You know, just, just do that. Do your own processing later with your own professional. Verbal underlining. The, the key words a person underlines by means of volume and emphasis. So expect some significant things to be said more softly. Expect lower volume when a client is talking about difficult issues. Match vocal tone to clients in these cases. So like I said earlier, when you are talking to somebody and they're, you know, talking quietly or then, you know, lean in and just say, okay, like what was going on in that situation? You don't want to say, yeah, tell me what was going on because then they, that kind of fear in them might be there and they shut down. So try to match those tones when you need to. Accents. What are your reactions to the following accents? Australian, British, English, Canadian. French, Pakistani, Castilian, Spanish, New England, Southern United States. Avoid stereotyping people with accents different from yours. Sometimes people learned a language. Sometimes two, two accents, I meant to say accents before, but sometimes two accents sound similar. So if you don't know or anything, ask. When I get a client that has a really cool British accent, I'm like, oh, I love your accent. You know, I don't say, oh, tell me about it because that's kind of weird, but I attend to it. I am very mindful. And if I don't understand, I say, can, can you repeat that please? And they are more than willing to do that for you. All right, body language, like eye contact, body language patterns differ according to culture. Maintain culturally appropriate distance. 
Note clients' movements in relation to you. Note your own body language patterns in the session. Maintain authenticity in the client relationship. Some people like closeness. Some people don't. Some therapists like closeness. Some don't. So you have to be attentive and authentic attentive and authentic to both yourself and your client. Verbal tracking is staying with your client's topic to encourage full elaboration of the narrative. Selective attention, something big I taught in psych. Selective attention is central to interviewing, counseling, and psychotherapy. Clients will talk about what counselors are willing to hear. How you attend determines the length of the session and whether the client will return because they have an inner dialogue too. And they're assessing you in a different way than you are assessing them. Observe the selective attention patterns of both yourself and your clients. What do your clients focus on? What topics do they seem to avoid? Ask yourself the same questions and hear everything, listen to everything. Selective attention, don't just tune other things out. Try to attend to all of it. There are times when it is inappropriate to attend to client statements. For example, a client may talk insistently about the same topic over and over again. Through failure to maintain eye contact, subtle shifts in posture and vocal tone, and deliberate jumps to more positive topics, you can facilitate the interview process. So if you find yourself going down a rabbit hole with your client and they are not moving on, use your skill to be able to shift gears in a new direction that's going to give them a better outlook. You don't want to keep focusing over, over the same thing. So you can ask them, you know, notice that in our session, we've been hitting the same point. So I feel like maybe there's something that there's more to the story that you would like to talk about. Just anything to get them off that spiral of the same thing. Redirect the conversation, like I was just saying, to focus on po positive assets. So whatever the negative is, ask them. There's a, there's a, a style, Columbo style, um, that you can do too. But ask them, when was there a time in this situation it worked out positively? When was the time that you know you thought like this and it ended up not being like that, but it worked out really well? You get them to focus and you take a more positive psychological route. All right, usefulness of silence. Sometimes the most useful thing you can do is to support your clients silently. And that means zip it, throw away the key. Well, not throw it away, just put the key down. Search for a natural break in the client's speech and attend appropriately. Don't interrupt them, sit back, Wait for that break to where you can say, you know what I've done in my sessions, I've done, because sometimes I forget, I have done very gracefully and nicely with clients. I will say, you know what, I'm going to stop you right there. I want to ask you this because either A, I'm going to forget, or I really feel it's important in this moment to say this. That's okay. That's appropriate. You just don't want to interrupt them. And then the auditory cortex in the brain remains active when you are attending to silence. So attending means being present. Just remember, just being present and hearing and listening to everything. Talk time. Clients can't talk while you do. So again, one talks, one listens, one listens, one talks. Review your sessions for talk time. Who talks more? You or the client. Maybe in one session, like I said, client talks a lot more. This is probably in the very beginning. They're talking, talking, talking. Then it becomes more balanced. So just be mindful of that. With adults, client talk time is greater than counselor talk time. With less verbal clients or children, you may expect client talk time is going to be less than counselor talk time. Social skills training is, is training in a specific set of psychoeducational strategies oriented toward teaching clients an array of interpersonal skills and behaviors. These client or clients, these skills include a wide range of behaviors such as listening, dating behaviors, drug refusal skills, assertiveness, mediation, and job interviewing procedures. Virtually all interpersonal actions can be taught through social skills training. If you feel that that will be a benefit to you, there are all types of classes on social skills training. You can take them in person or online. And if you can get them in your school, not for free, but 
class that talks, you know, that attends to social skills, take it. I've taken many that had that kind of embedded in the in the class. Training as treatment is a term that summarizes the method and goal of social skills training. Implications for your practice. Many clients can benefit from training and education and listening skills. So there is nothing wrong with offering or saying part of your practice is to provide psychoeducation. Psychoeducation could be materials. It could be giving them a website, giving them pamphlets, giving them uh, resources to go, you know, reach out to an agency for something. So you want to have a little bag of tricks, have a list of your go-to places. Um, if it's like domestic violence, maybe I refer a lot to the women's center. So have a list, you know, tricks in there and say, this would, this might be a really good place to check out. Don't give them advice about it. Don't tell them what to do, but just say, you know, I thought of something. And I think maybe if you feel like it, check this out. And they appreciate that because they're not being told what to do, but they're giving, they're being given these tools that if they decide to do it, they're the ones that did the work. So they get the credit for it. All right. Empathy experience. This is a good kind of overarching thing of empathy. So experiencing the client's world and story as if you were that client, understanding their key issues and expressing them accurately without adding your own thoughts, feelings, or meanings. This requires attending and observation skills, plus using the important keywords of the client while distilling and shortening the main ideas. So again, you're being reflective, you're listening, you're mimicking a little bit, and you're understanding that this is not your story, but imagine, man, imagine if that was me, thinking in that regard. And then the anticipated result, clients are gonna feel understood, they're going to be more engaged with you. They're going to want to solve those issues. Empathy is the best is best assessed by a client's reaction to a statement and their ability to continue the discussion in more depth and eventually with better self-understanding. That's when you know the work is really happening. When you start having those one-on-ones and you keep getting into your sessions two, three, four, five in, and you see their growth and you see their change, that is part in part because of you, because you made them feel that they had a place where they could trust. So they did all the work, they get all the credit, just like if they don't do the work, you're not blamed for that. They can't blame you. Don't give advice and you don't get blamed. So just remember that. All right, subtractive empathy. Counselors' responses give back less or distort what the client has said. Basic empathy. Counselors' responses are roughly interchangeable with those of the client. And then additive empathy, counselors' responses add to or link to something the client has said earlier, or a response may be a congruent idea or frame of reference that helps the client see a new perspective. Think about those types of empathy and what you're trying to emulate or what you should be emulating. All right, so... This three-point scale is often expanded for classifying and rating the quality of empathy as shown in a, se in a session. So you've got your level one, two, three, subtractive, interchangeable, which is your basic, and your additive. All right, empathy is identifiable through functional magne magnetic resonance imaging, so fMRIs, which look at blood flow to the brain and other key technologies. Key to this process are the mirror neurons, which fire when humans or animals act and when they observe actions by another. When listening skills are not successfully implemented, empathy falls apart. And listening and empathy are not just subtract, uh, subtract, they are not just abstract concepts, they are measurable and make a difference in people's lives. So this is the little blip on when it comes to neuroscience. This is when you need to know just a little bit about neurons. This is mirror neurons. It's part of the neurobiological component. So when you understand little things like this, you understand the inner workings maybe of what's going on with someone. All right, what do you think about Alan's positive and negative interviewing examples? These are um, attending behavior and empathy in action. Were they effective in developing a good working relationship with Azara? What differences did you notice in Azara's reactions to the first and second session segments? 
What are the major differences between the negative and the positive examples? Where do you think you're going to find that? Because I'm just saying it. So where do you think you're going to find it? Yep, you're right. The book. All right. The social distancing and reduced mobility required during the COVID-19 pandemic demanded online approaches in all areas of counseling, psychology, social work, psychiatry, education, and others. Telebehavioral health and psych telepsychology made it possible to provide education, prevention, assessment, and treatment from a distance. In many cases, this proved to be as effective as face-to-face. -face. So they've been coming out with a bunch of studies that are showing that face-to-face, -face, you know, in-person therapy is just as effective as doing telehealth. Uh, this practice has helped many clients, such as young, chronically ill uh, populations and persons experiencing anxiety, depression, or suicide ideation. I have clients that they do chat sessions because they can't, they can't do a phone session because they're nervous on the phone. Hearing my voice or, or, you know, them talking and hearing their voice makes them shut down. So if I can offer them a chat session to make them feel like at ease, you don't know that maybe down the road, they're going to feel that braveness to do a phone session and then maybe do a virtual face-to-face -face session. So ever since COVID, telehealth has blown up and I do a lot of telehealth sessions and they are amazing and equally as effective. Practitioners indicate that training in telehealth supervision facilitated delivery of effective services. It suggested that telebehavioral health training should be part of any mental health program. It wasn't really when I was getting trained, but that's because that was before the explosion of telehealth. They also reported high comfort and satisfaction using this new system due to the training received. They were able to make real connections with clients. I was pleasantly surprised to find out that telehealth is effective and I can engage with the client. And it really attuned me to listening. You focus on what you're hearing. So you may think that attending skills are simple and obvious and may be anxious to move to the hard stuff, but don't because like babies, you gotta crawl before you walk, walk before you run. Cognitive learning through reading and study does not mean one has the skills and is really able to listen to clients empathetically. Going to school, sitting down, doing assignments shows that you can be, that you can have, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You can, what's the word I'm looking for? When you can sit down and you can do your work, that you have management, that you can manage your time, that you can do these things. It doesn't mean you're learning the skill. So you have that and you've got the work hand in hand and that teaches you. A lot of people want to just jump into this and then they realize, wow, I don't listen. I really don't listen. So you want to do things slowly and get comfortable. Um, effective listening takes time, commitment, and intentional and deliberate practice. All right. So intentional practice is the magic. Recognize and enhance your natural talents. Greatness only happens with extensive practice. Practice is the breakfast of champions. And skipping practice means mediocre performance. Anytime you skip something, really, you're not giving it your all. So you want to go through all the proper steps because that's how you're going to be the best therapist. All right. So practice changes your body. Both the brain and body change with practice. Skills are specific. Each skill must be practiced completely before it can be integrated into superior performance. The brain drives the brawn. Changes in the brain are evident in scans. Areas of the brain relating to finger exercises or arm movements show brain growth in those areas. Expect the same in your brain as you truly master communication skills. Practice style is crucial. One can understand attending behavior intellectually but actually practicing the specific skills of attending makes the difference. So role play, like I said, do it with yourself in the mirror. Look at yourself. It's okay to talk to yourself, but try to find somebody if you can. Short-term intensity cannot replace long-term commitment. You will want to take what you learn about counseling skills, use it regularly. Practice provides a continuous feedback loop, which leads to even more improvement in addition Feedback from colleagues on your counseling style and skills is especially beneficial. So you want to ask your supervisor, you want to ask the people above you, how am I doing? How could I, you know, how can I make this better? How can I become better at listening in your opinion? 
All right, so key points and practice. Central goals of listening, the four aspects of attending, attending behavior, listening in individual and multicultural differences, attending behavior research, empathy, neuroscience of active listening and empathy, training is treatment, practice is of the essence, and of course, your portfolio of competencies and personal reflection is going to be a part of this week's work. So with that said, a lot of information, but pretty much the same theme, the same undertones, practice, practice attending, practice your listening skills, note your own issues when it comes to listening. Know, you know, how can I make this better? So again, you know what the extra credit is and you know what your work is for the week. So with that said, I hope you have a fabulous week and until chapter four, peace out.